So first of all, thank you very much for these uh, very kind words of introduction. Um, I'd also like to begin by saying that uh, I'm immensely honored and delighted to be a recipient of the Schoberg uh, Prize, uh, to have our work recognized uh, in, this, uh, in this manner. So uh, uh, I also feel uh, very strong emotions of, of gratitude for this, uh, uh, which I will get to later. Before I, I do that, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit of our, about our research uh, in the laboratory. And what I'd like to do, well, first of all, we work on cell growth control, in particular the TOR signaling pathway, as, as Ben mentioned. Uh, and what I'd like to do today is not give you an overview of the work in our laboratory, but rather to focus on one story, one current story. It's an unpublished story, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, and it deals, uh, it's one of the cancer-related uh, uh, projects in the lab. Uh, as, as Bank said, uh, TOR is involved in many different disease areas, uh, and we work on many different disease areas, but uh, this one story uh, deals with, with, with cancer. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to TOR signaling. So what you have here uh, is a, a condensed overview of the TOR field. Uh, this on the left is the very first ever model of TOR signaling published, one we published shortly after our discovery of TOR in 1991. I have to say, I'm actually embarrassed we published this model. <laughs> It, uh, it says very little other than the fact that TOR exists. There are more question marks here than anything else. It's, it actually reminds me of a Gary Larson cartoon more than a serious, uh, 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 serious model you'd find in a scientific publication. I don't know how many, of the people, how many people in the audience remember Gary Larson, but uh, uh, I'm sure the older members of the audience do. Um, since this uh, very early rudimentary model, uh, the field has progressed. Uh, uh, this is a more up-to-date model, but it's also now hopelessly out of date. Uh, we've stopped drawing models, uh, complete models of TOR signaling. It's become so complex, you'd have to do this in three dimensions. Um, and what's driven this complexity uh, 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 in the uh, TOR signaling network is this exponential increase in publications in this area. And what's driven this uh, increase in publications is that TOR turned out to be both fundamentally important and clinically important much more so than we suspected when we first started working on rapamycin back in the late 1980s. So um, let me uh, uh, take you back a little bit uh, uh, as a way of introducing you to the TOR uh, signaling uh, pathway. So uh, this is rapamycin, so the protein we work on, TOR, uh, as you heard, stands for target of rapamycin. Uh, and this is the, and rapamycin is a drug, it's a natural uh, drug. It's a uh, natural secondary metabolite secreted by a, a soil bacterium, which was isolated on, uh, on Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui. Hence, this drug is called uh, uh, rapamycin. And uh, uh, this, uh, the bacteria which produce this were originally isolated by a group of scientists in the 1960s. Uh, and what they were looking for were uh, uh, bacteria which produce some novel metabolite which they could then develop into an antifungal. They did uh, find the, uh, isolate this and found it did have antifungal activity, but as they were developing as an antifungal, they realized it had the undesirable side effect of suppressing the immune system. And of course, suppressing the immune system is the last thing you want to do to somebody with a fungal infection, so it was immediately rejected and, and discarded. Until uh, years later, it was now rediscovered uh, for the very property for which it had originally been discarded, for immunosuppression. So in the 1980s and 90s, uh, uh, transplantation surgery came into the clinic as a viable procedure due to the development of immunosuppressive, uh, uh, due to the development of immunosuppression. And it was drugs such as rapamycin and others, like cyclosporin A, which allowed this uh, development in the clinic of, of transplantation surgery. So now, uh, if you have a liver transplant, uh, the uh, chances of survival are large. Uh, if you had a liver transplant in, let's say, 1980, uh, chances of survival were, were small. Uh, 
However, since uh, the original development of rapamycin as an immunosuppressive, it's now become even more famous as an anti-cancer drug, uh, and it's also now used uh, in the clinic uh, uh, to treat cardiovascular disease, restenosis, restenosis after angioplasty in particular. So it has applications in three major, very different therapeutic areas, which also already begins to hint to the fact that uh, whatever this drug must do, uh, uh, whatever this drug does, it must uh, uh, do something rather central to affect uh, such different diseases. So what does TOR actually do, the target of, of rapamycin, the, the protein which this drug binds and inhibits? Well, uh, the TOR protein is a kinase, it's a protein kinase, very highly conserved protein kinase, conserved all the way from yeast to uh, mammalian, so this is an assumption we made early on when we started working on yeast to uh, attempt to elucidate the mechanism of action of the drug. Uh, and uh, what this uh, uh, kinase does, it, it, it forms a central hub in controlling cell growth. And by cell growth, I mean increase in cell size or cell mass, not increase in cell number. And it does that by controlling a large number of cellular processes which collectively determine mass accumulation and thereby cell size. And these, proper, and these uh, processes can be subdivided into two groups, the anabolic processes, which TOR activates, and the catabolic processes, which TOR inhibits. So what TOR does is it balances these opposing forces of synthesis and degradation, such that the cell will accumulate the appropriate level of mass in response to whatever uh, nutrients might be available. So in very simple terms, what TOR does, it controls our growth uh, in response to, to when we eat. Um, so how does TOR actually control all these different cellular processes? Well, there are effector signaling pathways which emanate from TOR, which then intersect with key proteins involved in all these processes. And in some cases, we know what those effector pathways are, and some we don't. But uh, over the last uh, 30 years, uh, and something I failed to mention in the previous slide is that we discovered TOR 30 years ago, so we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of the discovery of TOR. So over these 30 years, we, uh, we've uh, 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 described what uh, we call the TOR signaling network, and I, and I refer to it as a network, not as a signaling pathway, but it's in fact more than a single pathway, it's actually two pathways. Uh, and uh, this network is defined by these two complexes, which uh, we discovered in about the uh, year 2000, 2002, which define these two pathways. Uh, each one of these uh, uh, complexes, uh, the central catalytic subunit of which is TOR, in this case mTOR for mammalian TOR, uh, each one of these uh, complexes is functionally and structurally distinct, so each phosphorylates its own substrates to control its own processes. And this is a major uh, advance because it told us that TOR is, in fact, two separate uh, kinases, it's not a single uh, kinase. Now, like uh, TOR itself, which is conserved all the way from yeast to mammals, uh, these two complexes are also uh, conserved all the way from yeast to mammals. And in fact, the entire architecture of the uh, network is conserved all the way from yeast uh, to mammals. So the picture that's emerged is that this is a primordial or ancestral signaling network which is controlled, which has been conserved throughout eukaryotic evolution uh, to control this very fundamental process of cell growth. Now, the exception to that statement I just made is this part of the network up here, which is the growth factor signaling uh, pathway, which evolved later. This evolved with multicellularity and when that was then grafted onto this more primordial TOR signaling uh, components, which were already already existed in unicellular yeast. And the reason for that is that growth control in multicellular organisms, or metazoans, is more complex than growth control in unicellular organisms because in multicellular organisms, it's, it's critical to control the growth of every cell in the body uh, relative to every other cell in the body, such that our organs end up being properly proportioned. And that then is what this part of the network achieves. This controls growth into a in response to growth factors which control growth over a whole body plan. So now we know in uh, mammalian cells, TOR is activated by three inputs. Uh, the growth factor, which then controls growth over the whole body, pl over the whole body plan, uh, combined with local nutrients, amino acids uh, in particular, and then energy, local energy, ATP in particular. 
So when these three factors are present, energy, nutrients, and growth factors, the entire torsoling network is activated, these anabolic processes are, are turned on, catabolic processes are turned off, and cells uh, will grow. Now, another fascinating aspect of the TOR signaling network is the large number of diseases to which it's been functionally uh, linked. Uh, and these uh, diseases all have in common that they are due to inappropriate or ectopic cell growth. And these can be malignant forms of cell growth, such as cancer, or benign forms of cell growth, such as cardiac hypertrophy. But in all cases, uh, cell growth. It's been calculated that TOR is upregulated uh, and contributes to cancer in about 70 to 80 percent of all tumors. Now, uh, more recently, TOR has been implicated in another set of disorders, the so-called metabolic disorders. We know chronically high levels of circulating nutrients can upregulate the TOR uh, pathway even in the absence of growth factors, and this can lead to adipogenesis and obesity, which can in turn lead to type 2 diabetes. But more common, uh, uh, a, a more direct route to, di to diabetes is through this negative feedback loop in the TOR signaling network in which high levels of TOR can uh, inhibit uh, IRS in the insulin signaling pathway uh, and thereby confer insulin insensitivity, which as you know is one of the hallmarks of type 2 diabetes. And this then, uh, uh, in this, in this uh, context, some have actually argued that rapamycin uh, via inhibition of TOR could lead to inhibition of this negative feedback loop and restoration of signaling through the insulin pathway. And therefore, it could be applied now in a fourth therapeutic area, uh, diabetes. I don't think any pharma company is actually developing di uh, rapamycin as an anti-diabetic because there are a number of, of complications which would uh, prevent that. But something that gives at least credence to this notion is the fact that metformin, the world's most commonly prescribed anti-diabetic, works at least in part via inhibiting mTOR via AMPK. Uh, and the talk I will give uh, uh, in just a moment about our current research uh, deals with the role of TOR in cancer. I will not talk about diabetes today. Now, over the last 30 years, while we've been trying to uh, define or understand TOR, the physiology and pathophysiology of TOR, we've also been trying to understand the TOR function at the atomic level. Uh, and a few years ago, we published the structure of mammalian TOR complex 1, uh, which is shown here. Uh, it is a dimer of heterotrimers. So it contains, so the blue and gray is the mTOR protein itself. Uh, the green is another protein called Raptor. And the uh, orange is another protein called List 8. Because it's a dimer, it has two catalytic uh, uh, sites, a ca catalytic cleft here. This has a rather conventional structure of a kinase, a bilobe structure with a catalytic site uh, between the two lobes. We also determine the structure of, rap of rapamycin bound to TOR complex 1 to understand how this drug inhibits uh, uh, TOR complex 1. And what I've not told you is that rapamycin acts first by binding a small protein in the cell called FKBP, and it's then this FKBP rapamycin complex which binds to TOR. Uh, and we never knew why we needed uh, both rapamycin and FKBP uh, to inhibit TOR because rapamycin alone can bind uh, TOR but not inhibit it. And the structure uh, uh, elucidated or provided an answer to this question. So if you'll keep your eye focused here and here. So this is FKBP and rapamycin would form a glue, much like the glues you'll hear about later, which binds then FKBP to the lip of the catalytic cleft. And this then revealed the mechanism of action of this drug because it, uh, the way the drug works is by binding or gluing FKBP to the lip of this cleft, it forms a lid which blocks asset, access of substrates to the catalytic site, which is at the bottom of this uh, cleft here. Very unusual mechanism of action for a, uh, a kinase inhibitor. Uh, more, recently, more recently, we've also determined the structure of TOR complex 2, mammalian human TOR complex 2. Uh, that's shown over here. What we learned is TOR itself, here in blue, has the same structure in both complexes. It's now decorated by different substrates to to uh, confer the different function of TOR complex 2 compared to TOR complex 1. Uh, and I think uh, we learned much from the structure of this as well, but I think the most interesting thing we learned is it uh, resolved a, a question since we'd been dealing with since 2004, and that is we knew FKBP rapamycin could bind and inhibit TOR complex 1, 
but we also knew that it could not bind and inhibit TOR complex 2. So why is TOR and TOR complex 1 sensitive, but TOR and TOR complex 2 insensitive rapamycin? And the structure revealed uh, the answer, and that is that this subunit of TOR complex 2, which is specific to TOR complex 2, uh, binds TOR in a way which it masks the FKBP rapamycin binding site so that uh, FKBP, shown here in red, cannot bind the lip here and prevent access of substrates to the catalytic site in TOR, in TOR complex 2. Okay, so I've given you a kind of a rapid introduction to TOR, uh, both uh, physiology, pathophysiology, and uh, structural aspects, and I'd like to tell you about this current unpublished work in the lab. And this deals with uh, arginine, uh, the amino acid arginine, and how it promotes uh, liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and does so by reprogramming uh, metabolism. Uh, so it's been known for many years that uh, TOR, mTOR, uh, promotes cancer. Uh, too much TOR activity promotes cancer. But the underlying mechanism was unknown. So uh, we decided to study this. Uh, and to do so, we uh, developed a, a mouse, an mTOR-driven mouse model of liver cancer to, to, to study. Uh, and we did that by, uh, again, back to the mTOR signaling network. We deleted two tumor suppressors in this network, TSC and P10. And we deleted TSC, uh, and we did this specifically in the liver. We hyperactivate TOR complex 1. And then we combine that with a deletion of, of P10. We further activate TOR complex 1, but now we also hyperactivate TOR complex 2. So both complexes are now hyperactivated uh, in this uh, mouse. And we call this mouse the liver-specific double knockout. This is how I'll be referring to it in some of the slides ahead. So what did we see uh, in this mouse? Um, well, uh, uh, deletion of these uh, two tumor suppressors occurs at birth, and we see that uh, at four weeks of age we see hepatomegaly, or enlarged liver, and this continues throughout the lifetime of this mouse. Uh, and this is due to this growth uh, uh, inducing aspect of hyperactive TOR signaling. The patocytes in these livers are bigger and the, and the uh, liver itself gets bigger. By about uh, eight weeks of age, we start seeing uh, 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 non-fatty liver disease, or hepatosteatosis, which then progresses uh, to an inflamed liver. And by about 16 weeks of age, we start seeing very mild uh, forms of hepatocellular carcinoma, or liver cancer, and then by 20 weeks of age, there's very severe liver cancer uh, uh, in these uh, mice, and the mice have to be sacrificed at this, at this, at this point. So uh, we want to understand what is giving rise to these uh, uh, tumors in this liver uh, in a TOR-dependent manner. So we applied many uh, different omics approaches to, to these tumors, and what I'd like to start with is the metabolomic uh, uh, study we did. So we excised these individual tumors. Uh, we did uh, uh, study the metabolites in these tumors by mass spec. We identified about 16,000 metabolites, of which 4,000 were annotated. And of these 4,000, about 1,000 changed in the tumor versus control non-tumor tissue uh, from this liver. And we did the pathway enrichment analysis. We found that the metabolic pathway most affected was amino acid metabolism. We then did target analysis of, of all the amino acids in the tumors, and we found that indeed some amino acids change. Uh, most of those who change, uh, most uh, are decreased, but one amino acid in particular, and the one where the change was perhaps most dramatic, uh, there's an increase, and this is specifically for arginine. So we, of course, wondered why is arginine increased, and how, is this at all related to uh, the... Uh, uh, the ability of the tumor to grow. So we, uh, the first thing we did then was to look at our transcriptomic and proteomic studies to see uh, if the uh, arginine biosynthetic pathway was affected. So uh, this is the uh, arginine biosynthetic pathway. And let me introduce you to this key here. Uh, the box on the left refers to mRNA, so there's data from the transcriptome. Uh, the box on the right is uh, data from the proteome. It's a protein. Uh, and blue means it's down, red means it's up. And as you can see, all the enzymes, the genes encoding, and the proteins of the uh, arginine biosynthetic pathway, which is, by the way, is part of the urea cycle, uh, all these uh, are down, despite the fact that arginine levels are up. This was a little uh, counterintuitive. Uh, uh, 
so we uh, uh, assume that uh, the, there are high arginine concentrations in these tumor cells due to increased uh, import of arginine from the tumor environment. Uh, and there are two types of uh, histidine transporters, uh, uh, so-called uniporters, uh, and then antiporters. Antiporters are different from uniporters, and these rely on an antisolute, which has to be exported to bring arginine into the cell. And glutamine is normally the antisolute uh, that's used. Um, uh, and there are several uh, uh, different versions of these two different transporters as listed here. So we went back to our data and looked to see whether these transporters are changed in expression. Indeed, uh, they are all, uh, almost all are upregulated in the tumor compared to non-tumor uh, tissue. Uh, we couldn't detect the protein uh, uh, by uh, mass spec because they're membrane proteins and they're difficult to detect, but we can confirm by immunoblotting that these proteins are indeed increased in the tumor con compared to controls. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, recently the Christoph Glatt has shown that in the case of liver cancer, it's not glutamine, which is anti-solute for the anti-transporter, but it's asparagine. And uh, indeed, we also see in the uh, asparagine synthetase is upregulated in the tumor uh, compared to non-tumor. So everything you need now to increase import of histidine is upregulated in, uh, in these tumors. We actually did... Uh, uh, arginine transport assays, ex vivo, uh, material from the tumor. We found that indeed uh, arginine uptake is increased in the tumor compared to the control. So this then explains why arginine levels are so high, despite the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, the arginine biosynthetic pathway is, is, is down. I should say that it's long been known that arginine pathway uh, is down in tumors of many different types. Uh, but it was always assumed that arginine levels would also be down because no one would ever check arginine, actually checked arginine levels. So we wondered whether these high arginine levels are important for tumor genicity. So we went back to our mouse model uh, and put them on uh, different diets, one with full uh, arginine, 10% of normal arginine levels, and 1% of arginine uh, at eight weeks, and then looked at the livers at 20 weeks of age. And what we found is that as we decreased arginine in the diet, we indeed reduced uh, the uh, tumor burden in these livers. And that's qu uh, quantified over here. Uh, uh, tumor levels uh, uh, indeed decreased uh, dramatically. Um, and we looked, uh, assayed arginine levels in the cells uh, of these uh, hepatocytes and non-tumor cells of, the, uh, of these mice, and we found that indeed uh, uh, arginine levels were down in non-tumor tissue. And in the few escaper, so-called escaper tumors, which arose in these tumors, arginine levels were high. Again, a very strict correlation between high arginine levels and tumor genicity, suggesting that uh, uh, the arginine is indeed uh, important for, for tumor genicity. So now the question is, what is the arginine being used for? Uh, arginine is an uh, exceptionally versatile amino acid because it's used not only for protein synthesis, but it's also used to produce other amino acids. Uh, it's used as a signaling molecule. It's actually one of the key amino acids involved in the activation of TOR complex one. Uh, and it's also a precursor for polyamines, creatine, and nitric oxide. Uh, and we, just, uh, we eliminated all of these, uh, and we were left with polyamines. We wondered, could the cell accumulate high levels of arginine to produce polyamines, which are an essential metabolite uh, uh, in, in cells. Nobody really knows what polyamines do, but they're essential. So uh, here is then, the, again, the pathway of, uh, of uh, arginine synthesis, the urea cycle, the transporters which bring in arginine, and this is then how arginine is converted to the polyamines. Uh, the polyamines come in three different uh, uh, forms, putrescine, spermidine, and spermine, uh, and it's and these are produced from arginine via two parallel pathways. Uh, this is one here through uh, the enzyme agmatinase, and the other one is through ARG1, which uh, again uh, leads to production of putrescine, which then can be converted to the other amino acids. So here in very simple form is what I just showed you before. Arginine is converted to polyamines through the action, the, the redundant action of these two enzymes. And polyamines are extremely abundant in, in in liver cells, 
Uh, they accumulate in up to millimolar concentrations, so it would make sense that the cell would go to great length to, to be able to uh, produce uh, polyamines. However, uh, um, uh, uh, we found, much to our surprise, that the, the enzymes which convert arginine to polyamines are also off. Uh, 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 and this was uh, uh, despite the fact that polyamine levels were extremely high in these tumors, just like what we'd seen for arginine. The biosynthetic pathway is down, but the level of the product is, is high. And um, so uh, what this told us is that the, uh, and we then showed that polyamines also, the high level of polyamines due to increased in, uh, import of polyamines. And this was important because it told us that the arginine pool and the polyamine pools are uncoupled from each other. Uh, so in other words, the arginine is not accumulating high levels to produce high levels of polyamine. Arginine comes in through transport, and polyamines do uh, as well. Um, uh, so uh, uh, we wondered whether uh, the arginine and agmat uh, genes are down, or polyamine synthesis is down, to preserve high arginine levels. Uh, so we went back to our mouse model again, and what we did here, now we introduced uh, these two genes, ARG1 uh, or agmat, into our mouse in a way which they could not be turned off as the tumor developed. We put them under a different promoter uh, and asked, uh, what, uh, what are the consequences of this? Uh, the idea being that now if we uh, ensure expression of these two enzymes, uh, we would then consume the, the arginine. And would this then bring uh, tumor levels down? Indeed, uh, uh, the, no, the tumor burden was decreased, uh, dramatically decreased upon expression of either one of these two. Uh, so it appears that uh, um, uh, expression of ARG1 and AGMAT is, is turned off to ensure high levels of, uh, uh, of, of arginine, which tells us that it's arginine itself which is important for the tumors, unmet, unmetabolized arginine. Um, so... Um, uh, uh, then the question is, what is this arginine being used for? And if we go to the literature, we find there, there's emerging evidence that arginine is somehow involved in metabolic reprogramming. And perhaps the best, uh, the most famous example is in T cells where arginine uh, uh, activates uh, oxidative phosphorylation and nucleotide synthesis. So we wondered if the arginine could be required for metabolic reprogramming in tumors such that that new metabolism would uh, support uh, the proliferation of the tumor cells. And to study this, we, didn't, uh, we wanted to develop a different, uh, uh, a different system. Uh, we wanted to use cells because it's easier to do experiments with cells. So we reviewed a panel of human cancer, uh, liver cancer cell lines to see if we could find a cell line which mimicked what we'd seen uh, in, uh, in the mouse. And we did, in fact, find one, uh, SNU449, or so I found several. We chose one SNU449, which is lacking these two enzymes. Um, we could re-express ARG and AGMAT in this cell line. Uh, this would then bring down arginine levels in these, uh, in these cell lines. And we could also find this cell line uh, uh, upon re-expression of ARG1 and AGMAT uh, 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 cannot survive uh, under low concentrations of arginine. So this cell line mimics what we saw in, in the tumors in the mouse. And now we can do experiments for this with this uh, cell line. Uh, and we did uh, 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 determine the, the transcriptome of this cell line uh, with and without arginagmat, so with and without arginine, in other words. And we found that indeed uh, uh, metabolism was uh, significantly rewired uh, many different forms of metabolism, aldehyde, NAD, amino acid, pyruvate, glycolysis, uh, simply upon changes in arginine uh, levels. And we also then uh, asked whether this is also relevant in human cancer, and we looked at uh, human uh, tumor biopsies, tumor and non-tumor tissue from human uh, patients, and again we found what we found in mice, uh, ARG1, is lost and agmat are lost in the tumor uh, compared to non-tumor tissue. Arginine levels are also high in tumors from patients. Uh, and uh, uh, 
low levels of ARG or AGMAT also co correlate with low survival in these uh, patients. So what we see in the mice we think is also relevant to humans. So uh, this is a, a model summarizing what we think is happening. Uh, this is a normal liver cell where we have uh, high levels of, of enzymes of the urea cycle producing arginine, which are then converted, some of which is converted to polyamines. But in the tumor, this is all shut off. Uh, ARG1 agmen are also turned off. And this is, uh, to compensate for this, the cells take up large amounts of arginine or polyamine from the environment. And then we think it's this high arginine is acting as a novel kind of second uh, messenger in the cell to somehow reprogram metabolism at the transcriptional level. So we hypothesize there must be some arginine binding protein, perhaps a transcription factor, which when bound to uh, arginine can uh, activate or inhibit the genes leading to the metabolic reprogramming we see. And this would include the gene for asparagine synthetase, which forms as a kind of a positive feedback loop because if we have more asparagine synthetase, we have more asparagine, more uptake of arginine, uh, more metabolic reprogramming. So asparagine synthetase is key. So what we did uh, to see if such a protein exists, we prepared extracts from uh, tumors and SNU449 cells, ran them over a, a column containing a matrix coupled to arginine, and see what kind of proteins, arginine binding proteins, we would pull out. We had, uh, uh, we identified 42 different proteins, we knock down all 42 uh, of our top hits and see if knocking anyone down would have the same effect of decreasing arginine levels, in other words, bringing down asparagine synthetase, and indeed one did, RBM39, which uh, is a splicing factor and also a transcriptional coactivator. So now we can uh, update uh, our model. We think the high levels of arginine are binding RBM39, uh, and this is then leading to metabolic reprogramming, reprogramming at the mRNA uh, level. We have confirmed that RBM39 in vitro binds arginine, and we've confirmed that when we knock down RBM39, we, we knock out this metabolic reprogramming. So we're quite excited about this, um, about, this, uh, about this project and where we can go with RBM39, and of course it could be a, a good target for, for therapy. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I've run over time, I see. I, uh, let me uh, quickly give credit to the people in the lab who have uh, done this work. This is mainly the work of a very good postdoc by the name of Dirk, Mo Dirk Mossman, who was also helped by others. The earlier structural work I presented uh, is also recent work. This is uh, done in collaboration with my colleague uh, Tim Meyer at the Biocentrum and Nenad Ban at the ETH, both uh, structural biologists. Okay, I would also like to, uh, at this point, uh, express my, my deepest gratitude uh, to the Schoberger uh, uh, Foundation uh, for, for recognizing and encouraging our, our work. This is extremely, uh, extremely important to us. Uh, we could not be more grateful for this. Um, but I'd also like to uh, thank the Schoberger Foundation and even congratulate them for uh, their support of science in general, not uh, our uh, science uh, uh, alone or the science of the other laureates in this room. Um, I also, by the way, congratulate. Um, uh, uh, this is a time, the world is going through a very difficult time now. We're facing the, the double scourge of climate change and a pandemic where knowledge and science is more important than ever. So what the uh, Schoberg Foundation is doing uh, is extremely important. Uh, at a, at a key moment. It's a very noble thing that this foundation has done. So uh, uh, thank you very much to the foundation for doing that and uh, also uh, congratulations for having this visionary generosity to, to, to go this way. I'd also like to thank all the many colleagues in my lab who uh, have contributed to the work over the last 30 years. Um, too many to name, I'd like to name them all, but there are just too many uh, to name. I'd like to also support all the institutions which supported me, my, my institute, uh, my university, uh, the country of Switzerland who has uh, supported my research uh, extremely generously. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge my family who, uh, despite my, my absences, both physical and, 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 and mental, uh, have, uh, have uh, supported me. They, 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 there's an expression, 
behind every successful woman, behind every successful man, there is a surprised woman. And uh, uh, in my case, uh, I'm lucky to have three surprised women. Uh, this is my family, my wife Sabine, my daughter Zoe, and my daughter Leah. So many thank you to, to everybody and, of course, the Schoberg Foundation. 